Welcome to another episode of the BS Podcast, the show that looks at how behavioral change insights are being applied in the wild. Episodes feature renowned behavioral experts across industries and organizations, from management and marketing to policy and public health, and more. Let's dive in and see what all the BS is about. Here's your host from The Behaviorist, Nick Hobson. Hello, BS listeners, and welcome to this episode as part of the premiere launch of season two of the BS podcast. And I am just tickled pink, I must say, to welcome Rory Sutherland to the show. Rory is the vice chairman of Ogilvy and has co-founded a behavioral science practice within the agency. He works with talented psychology graduates who look for unseen opportunities in consumer behavior. These are the very small contextual changes which can have enormous effects on the decisions people make. For instance, tripling the sales rates of a call center by adding just a few sentences to the script. Before this, Rory was a copywriter and creative director at Ogilvy for over 20 years. Before his life-changing career at Ogilvy, Rory has been president of the IPA, chair of the judges for the direct jury at Cannes, and has spoken at TED Global. He is also an author having written The Wiki Man and, most recently newly published, Alchemy, The Surprising Power of Ideas That Don't Make Sense. Rory, welcome to the show. It's a huge pleasure to be on. Uh, just worth saying as a caveat for um, baffled searching people in North America, the book has a slightly different title in North America, which is Alchemy, which is ab- about the power of uh, brands, magic in business and life. Uh, so if you see a slightly different title with me as the author, that explains it. It's um, uh, it, it also has uh, 2% fewer vowels being the North American edition. Um, <laughs> that is an than, important caveat. Highly important consideration because I wouldn't want anybody seeing color with a U and being entirely derailed for the rest of the book. Um, so um, uh, that's the only that, that's the only difference, pretty much. There's also an audio book, which I think is the same in both places. Wonderful. Thank you for that. That is very important. And I'll be sure to link to both uh, in the in the show notes for for both audiences. Oh, I, you know, I always get in trouble. I'm a Canadian and I always get in trouble for dropping the U's from my uh, words such as color. I, I think I think I should probably go back to being a good a good Canadian. Or <laughs> it was weirdly, I mean, it was Noah Webster, wasn't it? It was an attempt to rationalize spelling. Right. Um, the United States has had two kind of binges at rationalizing English spelling. One of them was Noah Webster, who kind of summarily uh, took out the U from color and a bunch of other words. Uh, interestingly, the word glamour still retains it, doesn't it? You oh, get some strange things. Yeah. Similarly, Pittsburgh was one of the very few burgs in the U.S. which didn't have its H forcibly removed. H, yeah. <laughs> um, I think I think the original intention was to was to pronounce it Pittsburgh in the same way as Edinburgh. Edinburgh. Uh, oh. Yeah, but strangely, I think Pittsburgh campaigned to keep its H, whereas nearly nearly everywhere else, Williamsburg and so forth, uh, lost it. Um, but a lot, a lot of Amer- a lot of Brits don't realise this that, that that they assume that actually everybody except the Brit spells things with a U, and actually it's the other way around. It, it was a sort of unilateral thing, still resisted by some Southerons. There are kind of extreme, probably highly politically incorrect kind of um, uh, mm. people who regard this as evidence of Yankee cultural imperialism, and they perversely <laughs> they perversely put the U back in. It's also reminds me of the, I guess it's a similar lesson of the imperial versus metric system, right? It's just a, 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 another way the Americans are uh, really trying to, uh, to to differentiate themselves among among the crowd of, of globalists out there across the world, eh? Yeah, we, we're actually gloriously messy. We're in mid-Atlantic because we use miles on road signs, miles per hour in speed limits. Um, ah. the, kilometer, the kilometer doesn't, unlike Canadians, the kilometer hasn't um, taken over at all. And then we do some slightly odd things. We will use la- yards and meters interchangeably. Um, we yes. often, you know, we often will buy cheese by the pound and then it's weighed out by the gram. Um, and then, <laughs> uh, weirder still, in terms of ambient temperature, we tend to use Celsius or centigrade for low temperatures because then you can go, it's minus seven, you it's see. Cold. <laughs> but, but, but for high temperatures, we prefer Fahrenheit because then you can say temperatures soared into the 90s. You see, yeah. <laughs> journalism has this bizarre thing that depending on what you want to exaggerate, you choose one or other of the two systems. Oh, I love that. That's that's fantastic. So that, that brings me to, to maybe some opening questions that I have for you. Um, 
the the world is messy, and in, in the word, this is one of my favorite quotes as a, as a psychologist. So in the, in the world, in the words of pioneering psychologist William James, it's it's this blooming, buzzing confusion that our brains are designed, you know, through evolution by natural selection, and it does this. To, it attempts to piece together, you know, through various perceptual apparatuses. Um, to, to find food and and mating partners, really, and, and other things that are important in our lives. Um, I see our sciences as these human inventions to help reduce some of that buzzing confusion that's around us. But the problem that I've always seen is that the stimuli that are out there in the world are infinite, and our brains and our psychology are remarkably finite. So that means there's this sort of limit in our knowledge about the world and about our role in it and how we go about understanding it and ourselves and others. So is it in that, back to the book, is it in that wedge of the unknown, in in that infinite where the alchemist does his or her work? So how do you see that sort of unknown and how it fits in? First of all, I think that social psychology and behavioral science or economics should rightly, I think, sit on a bedrock of evolutionary psychology. Um, because uh, I don't think um, that's possibly, you know, I don't think you can accurately understand um, or, or readily accept some of the important lessons of behavioral science uh, without understanding the evolutionary origins. Not least, not, you know, first of all, um, a wonderful book uh, called The Case Against Reality, which is recently published by an American academic makes the point that actually our perception is not remotely objective. Um, mm. And it because actually, if we have in any model he creates, if evolution has to decide between an extra 1% of fitness at the price of a 4% loss of accuracy, it will punt for fitness every time. Mm. Okay. And uh, in any case, and there are lots and lots of cases in the wild where accuracy is not what um, the brain needs. It's actually um, uh, clarity of action, for example, or the, the detection of contrast in vision may be more important than the detection of uh, absolute color values. And so the second thing I think that's vitally important from evolutionary psychology, which includes work from both Robert Kurtzban and Robert Trivers, um, is the fact that it isn't in our evolutionary interest to have perfect introspective access to our own motivations. So that there is this black box, which is kind of operating at a very powerful level in the decisions we make, but which is beautifully phrased, I think, by Kurtzban as opaque to introspection. Mm. And, and and in a very interesting, some very interesting pieces, um, Robert Trivers writes about the fact that in many cases, self-deception is necessary to survival that you have to delude yourself before you can successfully delude other people. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. we, that, that, those two things are very interesting because I always talk about the broken binoculars as the mm -hmm. fundamental need for, for behavioral science in, in decision-making, which is most decisions are made on the basis of economics, which assumes perfect information, perfect trust, and pure objectivity. And that's one broken lens. And the other one is market research, where you rely on people to tell you what they want. And both mm -hmm. of those are, will give you a view which is incomplete and, in some cases, massively distorted. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. the first thing I think, you know, I've made this case, but other people have made it better than me, um, which is that economics is a dishonest profession because it seeks to model human behavior uh, with the same sense of certainty as you know, Newtonian physics. And it's attempting to place um, uh, something that should rest on a bedrock of psychology, which rests on biology, which rests on chemistry, which rests on physics, which rests on mathematics. It short circuits that by attempting to make um, something which models a highly complex uh, system. Uh, individual behavior is highly complex, let alone when you get to collective behavior, which which is, mm -hmm. you know, a further third body problem. Okay. And by attempting that short circuit, it fundamentally misrepresents things and, um, and, and, and creates a very false sense of certainty, I think. Now, I'll be absolutely honest with you. I don't think behavioral science is a science in the sense that a lot of people think of a science. OK, mm -hmm. I don't see my job as ever coming up with uh, something equivalent to the second law of thermodynamics or the laws of motion or anything of that kind. Um, I think if there were anything uh, that, that unfailingly reliable about human behavior, we would have kind of discovered it by now. Um, and it would have appeared to us banal and not really worth talking about. 
Um, mm -hmm. But what I do see it as being a science, in the better sense of a science, is a process of discovery. And I see the value of it not in being right. I, I don't envisage a day where someone comes along to the Ogilvy Behavioural Science Practice and we say with absolute certainty, you need to stop doing this and start doing that. There may be cases occasionally where you go, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, <laughs> but what we can do, in you know, infallibly almost, is to expand the possible solution space. Mm. So, you know, there will be certain solutions proposed, you know, by people who conduct market research or even uh, data science. Uh, there will be certain things proposed by people who uh, are essentially leaping on a very nice logical post-rationalization of how they see the world works, which is there for reasons of neatness rather than accuracy. Mm -hmm. But outside that, and this is why it's called alchemy, there's the scope to solve exactly the same problem or to exploit exactly the same opportunity in a completely different way um, using our understanding, imperfect though it may be, of psychology. So, and I would, I'd go a little further and say that, you know, not only is this a problem-solving tool, it's highly applied, um, at, the, you know, at the very least it can tell you something to test that you wouldn't have thought of testing that has the potential to make a huge upside difference to what you do. And, mm -hmm. you know, so many billion-dollar businesses, I would suggest, are partly owe their success to a few psychological factors which are often probably completely underestimated even by the people who created those businesses. Because we much prefer to write a Harvard Business Case Review which attributes the success of a business to its supply chain management or economies of scale or whatever than to attribute mm -hmm. it to having found a kind of hack or loophole uh, in um, the human brain. But I would say, OK, my confident prediction would be two. I'll, be, I'll give you two examples. OK, um, if Uber hadn't had the map, I don't think it would have gone anywhere. OK, if they developed everything that was Uber, but it hadn't had the map where you could watch the car approaching mm -hmm. and where it hadn't had mm -hmm. the estimate of likely wait time before you committed to booking a car. Two things of which I think are absolutely ingenious psychological hacks. Mm -hmm. I don't think it would have been sufficiently more enjoyable than any other cab app to have achieved its dominance. Um, Zoom, I'd probably say, also owes quite a lot of its success to the fact that it made something which was unwieldy. I mean, some of it is technological superiority. I'm not. I'm not suggesting you can produce any old crap and bang in a, a you know, bang in a, you know, a kind of mind meld, and um, and you're off to the races. But um, Zoom would be similar, and Dyson. I would also say that you know, if you mm -hmm. made those things beige and opaque, I don't think anybody would have bought them. Mm -hmm. So and this, so you talk about this in, you, if if I may just interject, you sort of talk about this with the trivial and the frivolous, um, with consumer behavior and consumer preferences and ideas. Um, is, is, is that, is that how you see people making their, you know, their mundane day-to-day -day decisions? Is it mostly on the trivial and the frivolous is, is, is and well, is that really <laughs> undergirded by this irrational, this irrationality of ours? What's trivial sort of depends on uh, what we deem to be trivial or oblique or tangential to the task in hand. And, you know, why I'm probably frustrating in meetings, because I'll start talking about things which to many people in the room seem like a total irrelevance, OK, <laughs> um, is that, of course, the messy thing about behavioural science is you're intervening in a complex system uh, where there isn't the level of certainty you can enjoy, I think it's fair to say, uh, in an engineering problem. The upside of that is that there are butterfly effects, so that sometimes you can achieve spectacular effects by tweaking something very, very small and apparently irrelevant. Mm -hmm. So the downside is, you know, lack of certainty. It's much more appealing to go to McKinsey, uh, who will say, you know, by reorganizing your supply chain, you can enjoy cost saving efficiencies of 7% than to go to someone like me who says, well, we might get absolutely nowhere. But if you're really lucky, you can spend £20,000 and make £10 million a year more, which we've done, by the way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so that love of certainty often drives people into the slightly, you know, Newtonian, you know, uh, high effort, you know, the assumption that reward has to be proportionate to expense or effort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and But the upside is, as I said, these little um, um, uh, butterfly effects. And if you find a butterfly, 
as I said, you add two lines of of text to a call center script. People had to choose and found the choice very different when they were on, difficult when they're on a phone call. And we simply added most people choose B, which was true by the way. And um, immediately most people's dilemma was resolved. Now, most people choose B to an economist is entirely irrelevant to the decision because of course you <laughs> you have perfect information, perfect trust, and you're simply seeking to maximize your own utility. And you furthermore mm. know exactly how much you're prepared to pay for that product and you know which of your preferences is which. But in, in of course, in decision making under uncertainty, um, social copying, as with habit, the reason social copying and habit are incredibly powerful forces in human behavior is that if you look at what humans are trying to do, which is they're more actively trying to avoid catastrophe than to achieve perfection. Mm-hmm. And there's a whole load of work, by the way, in ergodicity, which which provides the mathematics of this, because they point out that most economic assumptions are based on the assumption of ergodicity, uh, which is fundamentally wrong. Once you understand that people are trying to minimise the variance of the outcome, then social copying makes a kind of sense. And therefore, if most people choose B and I'm kind of indifferent, if I'm a kind of Burrier's ass, unable to decide between A, B and C, the fact that actually most people choose B kind of clinches it for me. It provides mm-hmm. an and, additional and reason. To go that direction. And, and an intelligent, just... We would not be an intelligent species if we didn't factor in the behavior of others in making our decisions. We would have long I mean, gone extinct. You know, we have long gone extinct. I mean, there's extraordinary, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, okay, gosh, all those, you know, all those antelope appear to be running away from something, but I regard that information as entirely irrelevant. I must walk over in that direction and see what it is that has frightened them. That'll be a really stupid <laughs> fucking antelope, right? Okay. That antelope isn't going to make it to bloody adolescence. Um, and, um, so, so interesting, you know, and the other things that, you know, I think are important in evolutionary psychology and our, our urge to experiment diminishes with age because we have both more past experience to draw on and we also have fewer, li- less li- life years, fewer life years left in which to benefit from a new discovery. So conservatism mm-hmm. among the aging is a perfectly sensible evolutionary adaptation. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. If you think, you know, if you think, of, if you think in evolutionary terms. So, so that's, I mean, you are obviously privy to, you have this evolutionary bent and I, I do as well. I was, unapologetically, that, that's my training. Yeah, yeah. Cause it's true. And, and yet what right. I find it is, but it is what I find interesting though, is that, so in, you're, you're saying in, in economics, it's, it's wholly absent from, at least from like your traditional neoclassical economics. What I find interesting in social psychology, and this is in the, this is in the academy, like not to mention, forget about anything, you know, in, 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 in industry or in dare I, in, not even close within management consulting or agencies, is that in, ac- in the academy, the social psychologists really made an earnest attempt to bring in functional explanations and evolutionary explanations. And what ended up happening is there was this whole camp, this sort of subdivision within psychology, and they still exist, and they call themselves evolutionary sociobiologists or social psychologists. And they created such a rift, such a division within the science of social psychology and behavioral science by extension. You have the one camp that says, like you and I, absolutely, there's, it, may, it just makes so much sense. It gives, this, it gives a, a, an, an incredible solid foundation upon which we can rest our theories and assumptions. And it, you know, it points to the seemingly irrational, the, the irrational side of humans. But when you look deeper, it actually makes total sense. It's functional. It's evolutionarily functional. It's adaptive. So that's Camp A. And then there's Camp B in the academy. And they are very much opposed to any sort of functional or adaptionist, adaptationist explanation for fear of it. How should I say? Uh, limiting human ingenuity. It's almost it almost like it's a it's um it's a threat to our sort of basic free will as humans. So I'm curious as as somebody who's in in you know the industry and in business, what's the what do you think is the appetite for evolutionary thinking? Well, I suspect in the academy, part of the aversion um, is political. Which is, if you're on the extreme left, it's a kind of case against the perfectibility of man. Uh, And you also have a terror, apart from the Nazi associations, which are another factor, of course. (laughs) Um, 
uh, you know, uh, which is, but I mean, you know, I mean, I, I don't think you should judge something, the quality of something by who likes it entirely. You know, the, you know, the Germans got trains running on time. I wouldn't say that we need to make our trains massively unpunctual just to, you know, remove ourselves from Nazi taint. OK, um, uh, but but also also, I mean, it, it can be used and you can see this, particularly in things like gender difference. It could be used as essentially justifying the status quo and suggesting that there are things that are innate and unchanging. Yes, which right. is, of yep. course, kind of that's kryptonite to a certain sort of person. Um, it's yep. never, by the way, um, it's never really um, uh, met with the complete horror I mean, I've talked I've talked about evolutionary origins of certain things in a business context, and I've never had any complaints. Hmm. Um, hmm. And so, I mean, in, in a weird way, I mean, it, rather like viruses that can only thrive in particular environments. I think there are certain elements of politics that can only exist within universities because. Uh, you know, there's a there's a peculiar kind of political um, manichaeanism, which is, you know, basically everybody on the left is good, everybody on the right is evil. OK, now, <laughs> once you enter a workplace, that doesn't really stand up to scrutiny, because if you enter a messy place, which is a business, what do you quite rapidly find is there are left wing people who are total assholes and there are right wing people who are actually quite <laughs> nice and decent. <laughs> yeah. and that, you know, your your fantasy categorization of how the world works. I mean, I always tease Americans with this, where I slightly tease metropolitan Americans by saying the red states are full of, of nice people who are, try, who are pretending to be nasty, and the blue states are full of nasty people who are <laughs> pretending to be nice. And uh, the reason I say it is because it's 10% true, okay? There's a little bit of truth in that. To be honest, I think I'd rather break down in Texas than in Massachusetts. You know, the likelihood yeah. that someone would actually help me out. Help out, Fair. yeah, yeah, yeah. I <laughs> okay. agree. I agree. And and back to the, to the academy, it is especially, and we do know this from work by John Heights, and he has this um, this uh, this initiative called the Heterodox Academy, where he a few years ago at our at our uh, I say our I'm no longer in academia, but the the social psychology their flagship big conference yearly conference tens of thousands of social psychologists and graduates psychology graduates and training attend, and he had a huge keynote where he basically called out. Um, called us out on this on this clear political bias um, and said that we as supposed experts in human behavior, uh, there are about, I think the estimate was about 95% were left-leaning versus, I don't know, 3% um, uh, libertarian, let's say, or other, and then 2 or th- two or 3% or whatever the remaining, if my math is off there, uh, were conservative. So his, his argument and others who joined him in that aim was that how how much can we actually understand all or as much of human nature as we claim to be do or you know, studying it as as much as we claim to be doing when we're missing out and and our our biases are potentially leading us you know off these 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 not wrong paths but these different sorts of paths and we're we're ignoring and and overlooking the ones that exist over here and not even seeing altogether so it's interesting to that and I agree with you because having been trained and raised and brought up in academia when I came out I was like whoa that world is fucking weird and is not reflection of the, of reality whatsoever no I mean I want to say the same that Madison Avenue um and London Adland are also unrepresentative in that uh they're demographically unrepresentative probably ethnically unrepresentative but they're also overwhelmingly um packed with people who live in mega cities I don't just mean cities you know, I don't mean kind of Phoenix or Houston. You know, it's New York, London, Singapore. Those places are spectacularly unrepresentative in many ways. Um, I have an anthropologist mm-hmm. friend who always says that quite a lot of his theory is that when you, if you're, if you're to use the language of um, a guy called, I think it's Philip Goodhart, uh, which is a somewhere. In other words, a large part of your identity resides in a place as distinct from being an anywhere. There's quite a bit of reciprocal altruism going on all the time in your life, right? Mm-hmm. 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 And uh, you know, you, so you live close to your parents and you look after them. You, you know, I'm, I'm a huge admirer of the American Midwest and Canada because they seem to be rare places where you have a large amount of financial capital which hasn't destroyed social capital. So I noticed mm-hmm. when I visited Wisconsin that you know there are people with five car garages and five bedroom houses who drive their neighbors to the airport. 
you know, it's 50 miles, <laughs> right? Now, in London, yeah. I've known people in London who I've known since I was five, but if I rang them up and said, could you pick me up from the airport? They'd piss off, get a cab, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so one of the things that mega cities do is they actually remove opportunities for um, reciprocal altruism. And so his theory as an anthropologist is that there's this frustrated altruistic urge, which cities in many cases fail to capture very well. And it also leads to some you know, slightly strange millennial behaviours where at a global level, because I think I think somewheres are not really utilitarians. Right. Somewheres mm-hmm. think that your obligation um, to some extent is is strained and diluted with distance. So if your next door neighbor's mm. house catches fire, you're under a greater obligation than if someone's house catches fire 20 miles away, you know, all that sort of stuff. Mm. And mm-hmm. that you you tend to operate, I think, within polycentric um, uh, groups. And yet if you're in a large city, quite a lot of that stuff is destroyed by the very scale of the place. Not necessarily. You can create communities within cities, but it's harder to do. People work long hours. Uh, in many ways, you know, you get a lot of people who are notionally highly altruistic, but their whole attitude towards their own work and advancement is extraordinarily individualistic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so there's something going on there where I think, you know, just as um, uh, Frederick Forsyth said, you know, uh, or John le Carré might have been actually, a desk is a dangerous place from which to view the world. I'd also say that a very large city is a dangerous place from which to attempt to understand human behaviour. Um, mm-hmm. And that comes mm-hmm. into the whole weird debate as well. But universities, you might argue, are even weirder still. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. Because if you think about yeah. it, what they essentially are rewarding is the talent of overgeneralization. So you know, there's a difference between academia and business, and there are lots of differences between academia and business. And the longer I spend comparing the two, the more I am impressed by business, in a way, as a problem-solving technology. Mm-hmm. Because it's very possible to produce generalizable rules, um, which, which, you know, have, you know, by aggregating enough stuff, you can produce some finding which is true, uh, you know, P less than 0.05, but which is... <laughs> actually at a local level is basically useless because in mm-hmm. intervening at the local level the context the setting all the other things are what really matters so you know an example of that is knowing what our naught is in a pandemic only allows you to intervene at a national level pretty much yep. what you really need to know is how our naught varies from person to person and from place to place right and so, you know, th- so, I think that the quest for generalization is actually a misapplication of science. I think what I mean, my my argument with science is actually a large part of it is the acknowledgement of what you don't know and therefore what you need to test. Yes. Yes. Um, and this is this has come up in past episodes with um, <clears throat> I had my actually my PhD advisor and mentor on um, Mickey Inslicht and also with Dilip Solman in, in the earlier episodes of season one, where we were talking about just this idea of how do we operate as scientists in the lab or scientists in universities versus scientists in practice as behavioral practitioners? What is that relationship? What is that dynamic? How does the knowledge get shared and transferred between those two domains? Um, How much preference do we give one or priority do we give one over the other? And I think what is the mistake, and, and I mean, the whole like behavioral science and practice is still so new. So obviously we're still in our infancy. There's still a lot of, a lot of growing up to be done. But I think the mistake is that we assume that the, the, the transfer of knowledge flowed from it, the academy to um, the real world, you know, whether it's policy or, or for profit or whatever the, it is. The relationship's complex. And by the way, you see the difference in the debate over p-values, which is that student who was a guy called Seely Gossett, who was working mm-hmm. for Guinness, who came up with the student's tea distribution. R.A. Mm-hmm. Fisher, who was a civil servant, then translated that into, you know, he made the statement that, you know, P being less than 0.05 is good enough for practical purposes. And Gossett said, which I think he's, I mean, I, as a business person, I'm, you know, Gossett actually had to produce Guinness, right? He had to produce some beer. 
Okay, yeah. you know he wasn't he wasn't going to get promoted through being part of a fantastic citation ring or something, right? And he argued that no, 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 this is absolute nonsense. The level of certainty you require depends on the circumstances. So if you're betting the farm on something, 0.05 isn't good enough. If you're merely investigating whether something might require further testing, or whether something is worth worthy of an experiment, then it's entirely different. And so the upside and downside consequences should affect the degree of certainty you require. Mm -hmm. Change your priors. And that's why I think it should be more of like a Bayesian statistics approach as opposed to this hard line P less than 0.05. I get a bit weirded out by the masks debate because there are people going, well, there's no actual peer reviewed, you know, um, uh, you know, science um, that uh, proves the efficacy of masks. Okay. And you say, well, look, first of all, there are a load of things we don't know. Okay, does the initial dose affect transmission? In other words, you know, is there a minimum dose for transmissibility? Right. Um, Is the course of the disease affected by the size of the initial dose? Okay, is there a path dependency here? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. we need to know those things. But the likelihood that a mask will reduce transmission seems to be much, much higher than the likelihood that it would actually increase it. Or, or would would have negative effects. I mean, there are some behavioral science arguments like it will increase people's confidence, so they'll get closer to each other. I'd also argue I, the I contrary, which marginal. is, I think that's highly marginal. Um, I yeah. think the mask acts as a reminder, probably, to self distance. But also, of course, someone not wearing a mask is very visibly a um, a, a norm breaker, and therefore you get the notice to give them an extra wide berth when you see them fifty feet away. Mm-hmm. So you know you mm-hmm. have all manner of all manner of possible benefits, but the downside seems to be relatively trivial. And my argument would be that you, it, it, what Seely Gossett would probably say is, until you know more, you must give the benefit of the doubt one way or the other, um, even if you know the level of certainty is relatively low. Exactly, and I'm, I, I put another way is one of my favorite, and I have to remind myself that of this as I'm doing science, um, you know, in the real world. Is that absence of evidence does not mean evidence, uh, evidence of, of absence. absence, correct? No, and, and that's and, such a, know, such an important thing to rem- to remind ourselves. I mean, I, you know, I mean the. Um... Uh, you know, I, I, I think it's an extraordinary thing where sometimes there's a very good piece written by Deirdre McCloskey on this, attacking the whole p-values thing, because saying that by your adherence to this arbitrary measure, uh, there's both a huge opportunity cost and a dangerous loss you know, in both directions, i.e. I, excessive caution in some cases, uh, excessive confidence in others. And that, um, now, I, I mean, it is it is interesting. I mean, the Behavioural Insights team, which is the government-founded uh, behavioural science entity in London, for example, for whom I have great respect, by the way. I'm not dissing them, but they all come from a much, uh, much more rigorous academic background than me. 30 years in advertising, you know, a good anecdote's pretty much, you know, reasonable. <laughs> you, you, you can base a £20 million investment decision on an anecdote, which, by the way, if... If the anecdote reveals something which is highly counterintuitive, might not be a bad thing to do. Because yeah, you don't, say, don't discount universally that. True. Yeah. Don't discount that because if nobody else is in this space because it seems to make no sense, okay, like Dyson, okay, charging $500 for a vacuum cleaner, you know, no one was thinking that was a sensible thing to do. So in the event of success, it's likely that you are going to be disproportionately successful because of the counterintuitive foundations on which your hunch is based. Um, but, but where I noticed with the behavioral science team, behavioral insights team, they did an experiment on uh, r- loft insulation. And they tested the, the hypothesis, which I think was largely right, is most people's lofts or attics are full of junk. And therefore, the obstacle to having your insulation installed is the fact that you first have to clear out all this shit, okay, and carry it down a ladder. And they offered, and they tested through door drop, two services, one of which was simply a um, a 300 pound loft insulation, which would pay for itself in a certain length of time. And the other one was double the price. It was something like 600 pounds, but people would come and clear your loft, insulate it, and then return anything you wanted back to the loft while taking away any junk you wanted disposed of. Okay. Hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And because they didn't, re- I think because they overestimated the response rates you get from door drops, which are always going to be, you know, 0.01%, they never mm-hmm. got a response rate to the level which was statistically significant. Okay. Mm. And so they more or less rejected this finding. Now, I looked at it as a business person and I looked at the findings. I said, hold on a second. You've got twice as many people paying for a £600 product as you have for a £300 product. And you're saying that's not significant, right? <laughs> right. Now, now, no businessman would go, ah, but according to our, you know, our calculus, you know, this is uh, insufficient. <laughs> I'm going, you got twice as many people paying £600 as you have paying £300. Cur bloody ching, we're off to the yeah. goddamn races, right? That, that's how a businessman makes the decision. You know, you go whoop de doo we're on to something here. You would not say, no, 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 we lack the necessary, you know, unfortunately my career will not be um, uh, um, advanced because uh, uh, the p-value is insufficient to get through peer review, right? Okay, who gives a toss, right? So you know one of one of one of you know one of the great things I think I think businesses do is they do instinctively place a value on findings in proportion to their implications and applicability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think and, I think and, what, and, what, and, I see and, the risk of us. I see the risk of us doing behavioral science, and and this is why doing behavioral science in the lab is so different from doing behavioral science in the wild, is that you have to consider some of those more practical. Uh, factors and you have to be you have to be pragmatic in your considerations and your recommendations. But what I also see happening with some you know really really talented firms and organizations uh, on the policy side and in, on, on the for profit side who are applying behavioral insights and behavioral science is they're trying to stick too much to the laboratory research you know in lab research ways of doing things and I think that's going to be to our detriment as we continue to sort of mature. There's, another, the there's another really important. Baconian point, which is in, okay, what you're looking for in a science is something that's generalizable, okay? And when he wrote the book Predictably Irrational, Ariely, quite rightly and intelligently, wrote the book, predict, wrote the word predictably into the title, mm-hmm. because he said, this isn't just random self cancelling um, uh, um, uh, randomness, you know, ir- irrationality. You know, there is a pattern you can discern in some of this. I'm very uncomfortable with the word bias, by the way. I'm not very uncomfortable with the word bias in institutional decision-making because what in institutional decision-making you're trying to do is quite often overtly stated, okay? But actually, an an awful lot of bias in consumer decision-making is simply because we don't know and the consumer doesn't know what they're really trying to do when they're making a decision. Brand preference, a lot of economists would say, is a bias. I would argue Mm -hmm. that since a branded good and a brand owner has much more to lose in the medium to long term from selling a bad product than someone you've never heard of who has no reputational skin in the game, the preference for paying a premium for a brand as a variance reduction heuristic is actually a perfectly sensible thing to do. So to call that a bias is unsafe. Okay, and to go and to go back to the sort of evolutionary explanation, yeah. and this is what I know. There's folks like Marty Hazelton <laughs> and even Gerd Gigerenzer have said we need to be careful about the words we use in the nomenclature. We've we we started with heuristics, and then somewhere along the way, maybe because of Kahneman, maybe because of thinking fast and slow, um, we ended up settling on bias. And I think that was a mistake, to be honest. I do occasionally in a, in a government meeting in the cabinet office in number 10 on how you get younger people to contribute to pensions. Mm-hmm. Um, I do occasionally throw in a Darwin bomb into the conversation. <laughs> and Darwin my bomb. argument was, I said, there is one other thing you have to consider. I accept all your economic arguments that the earlier you start saving, um, uh, then the you know the greater the value of your pension, disproportionately so, and I accept that from an economic standpoint. Mm-hmm. However, a of course there's much less uncertainty, so um, the need for a young person who probably has no savings not to commit to something which you know might prove disastrous is obviously greater, um, uh, because they're that much closer to potential bankruptcy. But I said there's also a Darwinian case where maybe you ought to just give up until people are 30. And I said the reason is that what is the most important thing you can do um, as a 25-year-old on, you know, uh, roughly on average, it's probably to find a good, attractive, non-insane life partner with whom you can mate. And I said, (laughs) now, I I said, I don't know much about this because I'm in my 50s, but I'm fairly sure 
that putting a Ford Mustang on Tinder would do you a bit better than talking about your pension. Okay, <laughs> I don't know anybody who's actually pulled by inviting someone out for the evening to talk about their their IRAs or their four hundred one ks or whatever it is you have. Right? It's not. Yeah, we've really our sexy. RSPs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's not other, a signal. Other, other Darwin bomb is that if rationality were that important in evolutionary terms, accountants would be really sexy. But if you notice, you know, male strippers tend to dress up as firemen uh, rather than um, actuaries. <laughs> Right, <laughs> that's, you know, that's an interesting saying, image you just put into my head. Let's just observe this and say that there may be something in it without making it, you know, without going any further. And how do they react to those Darwin bombs? Um, well, it's very interesting because it's kind of in that reaction where we know you're right, but we cannot acknowledge this in our decision making. Hmm. But I mean, you, you know, if you think about it, what is the person trying to do who's 27? Well, when you're 27, being 65 is incredibly remote because actually what's more important in evolutionary terms is that you reproduce before you get there. <laughs> and, um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's, it's, I, I've heard some work and this might be in, this might have crept, made its way into some policy decision making. And I might do my best to go find it and put it in the show notes for listeners is this idea of fast life versus slow life strategy. And for those people yes. who find K. themselves surrounded by... There's a letter K that's used. You have loads What's of that? kids and you have... K, I think, is the letter that's sometimes used to denote fast versus slow. You have a oh, high okay, K yes, or yes, a low yes. K. Yeah, yes, which is yes. you, you either reproduce like crazy and hope or you have two children and you invest in them insanely as a helicopter parent. Um, exactly. And both strategies, you know, depending on circumstances and environment um, and indeed what everybody else does, by the way, um, right, right. Uh, the relative payoff will change. There's this one. There's this one set of studies, remarkable set of studies, which actually find that for for young women who are raised in more chaotic and socially socially disruptive environments and contexts, that they will actually get their period sooner. Statistic. Well, here we go again. Statistically significant speaking, um, yeah. to suggest that for them, the strategy that makes most sense is to is to find a mate, procreate, and 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 be quick about it. Uh, given yeah. the sort of chaos that's happening around them. I mean, that's just fascinating. Scary, well, it may have been, of course, in those environments, of course, you're much safer uh, as well, if you can find a mate. Right. So that's a good argument. That's a good yeah, yeah. follow-up as well. Yeah. 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 So, so, so there may be all um, sorts a bit of, of a, the same thing. <clears throat> exactly. A um, bit, bit of a pivot here is uh, there's this there's this quote, and you know, the internet is a weird, weird place, so do feel free to fact check it, uh, where I, I, you were saying... Quote, economics is obsessed with the gains arising from scale, but identity does not scale neatly or quickly. And for me, I'm thinking, ain't that the truth? Um, and I feel like this is painfully clear in people's attitudes when it, when it involves ideology and anything to do with sacred values, deeply held truths that people, that people hold. What are your, what are your, what are your thoughts well, on that? I think on one that? of the problems, which I think applies in business as much as it does in government and public policy, is that the gains to scale are more quantifiable and sooner to appear than the costs. Hmm. <clears throat> and so the gains to efficiency are quite easy to calculate and, and can be delivered uh, with a degree of reliable predictability, whereas the costs that you incur... Now, it obviously, hmm. where the extent to which you scale, Eleanor Ostrom was the economist who wrote on this most interestingly, looking at, I think it was the Kansas City Police Department, where there mm -hmm. are certain things mm -hmm. you want to centralise, okay? You, you kind of want to centralise forensics in a police department, because it doesn't make sense every precinct having its own forensics department. Um, you know, they'd be inactive a large part of the time. On the other hand, when it comes to precinct policing, keeping it local and probably within the Dunbar number or something, okay? <laughs> Very interestingly, Robin Dunbar, um, who gave his name to the Dunbar number of 150 or so, was also mm -hmm. a keen Brexiter, which fascinated me. Oh, because, really? You know, in pro-Brexit was not common in academic circles, but he was an absolute no, vociferous supporter. And one of I the arguments is... You know, there are scales at which we can operate cohesively. And, um, you know, it's pretty interesting how in the presence of coronavirus, Europe pretty much reverted to nation states and borders as the units mm. of containment. Yeah, OK, yeah. and if you're looking at something like, you know, there's a reason why businesses 
you know, tend to, and military, the military tend to operate in clusters of um, polycentric. You know, you have, if, if you look at something like an Oxford college, you have a college where there are about 150 people in each year, then you have the university. Okay. Yeah. And the, and there are things which are, which I, I would argue that um, you can sometimes take a local solution and generalize it up, but it's much harder to take a general solution and localize it down. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. a great guy called Luca Delana said that the British didn't leave the European Union because they didn't care enough about Europe, but because Europe didn't care about enough about Britain. And Britain is a bit of an outlier, as Italy is, as Greece is. Okay, you're not actually in the European mainstream in quite a few respect you know you're english speaking we're kind of mid atlantic in our mentality and our culture and so on and so the argument is that it's impossible once you have 29 countries it's impossible for um operating at that level of uh, of centralization to solve the problems that matter to people on the ground mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because they're specific to the situation and so, you know, that academic urge, which is let us find generalizable rules, maybe should occasionally take a back seat to this thing works for some people. Maybe. So mm. the difference in business, right, is when you invent the Dyson vacuum cleaner, it doesn't need to appeal to everybody. Okay? <laughs> right. The rule that says mm. that um, uh, people will pay 500 pounds for a vacuum cleaner is highly limited. Right. But mm. frankly, if that's true of just 10 percent of people, you're in business, mate. OK, yeah. it's like Kevin so, Kelly's so, so, uh, 1000 true fans idea. And that, that's that's you also you know, stand up comedians have started to spot the same thing, which is basically, I think, as Stuart Lee said in the UK, if you've got 5000 people who will give you 10 pounds a year, you're now a comedian. <laughs> you know, you can survive. <laughs> then everything else, the TV appearances and the other stuff, they're kind of bonus, you know, on top. Bonus. Yeah, yeah. 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 Interesting. Well, we are we're at time, Rory. I could go on uh, for for much longer, but uh, just to respect to your back. time, it's been a wonderful conversation. Really fantastic. Yes, please please do. So uh, so congratulations on the on the book of both titles in the US and the One UK. One final thing, if you can plug yeah. anything, we're having a behavioral science festival, twelve hours, starting in Sydney, working all our way west to Hawaii on June the twelfth nudgestock.co.uk and we'll be streaming it live you can obviously watch it later if you can't make the 12th of june but you can probably make an hour or two on the 12th of june given how long this thing's gonna gonna go on yeah. and um <laughs> if you go to nudgestock.co.uk you can register we hope to be able to stream it to youtube so anybody with a smart tv can watch it in the comfort of their own lockdown Oh, wonderful. We will. I will push that. I will mention it to all my folks and listeners, because I know a lot of people pay attention to you guys, and uh, I will be there myself. Thanks so much, Roy. I really appreciate it. Hey, Nick here once more. A final farewell note before ending. All the show notes, links to papers, resources, and materials mentioned in the episode can be found on the BS Podcast page of The Behaviorist, where you can find all episodes and lots of other interesting, easy-to-apply, science-y stuff. Just go to www.behaviorist.biz slash BS Podcast. And lastly, if you'd like to join me in the mission of spreading the good BS word, remember to rate and review the show on iTunes. Why should you? Because one, you're a part of a digital wide social proof exercise. Two, you're helping combat the negativity bias in the form of positive reviews. And three, it's a little pre commitment for your habitual podcast listening, a little investment to keep you coming back for more BS. I mean, how much more behavioral can you get? Thanks again for listening. Until next time, remember, keep your facts ugly and your hypotheses beautiful.